from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. I've been keto now for over two years and it has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs under 20 grams a day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like full fat dairy. Choose delicious fatty proteins and be free and easy with oily dressings on salad and butter on your veggies. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalised keto. You'll hear all sorts of ways to keto from my guests. There is no one way to do keto, no one size fits all. I hope to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we really can't give you medical advice. It's always best to consult your own doctor when making big changes to your diet and lifestyle because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Wouldn't it be helpful to have one place where you could find all the links? Want to sign up to my new Patreon exclusive Facebook group, Daisy's Lovelies? No problem. How about subscribing to my YouTube channel? Please help me notch up my first thousand subscribers by going to links.ketowomanpodcast.com and following the YouTube link. Not following me on Instagram yet? Hit the Instagram button. You get the idea. All the buttons, all the links you need are at links.ketowomanpodcast.com. Thank you, Dawn Michelle, for supporting me and this podcast by making a pledge at my Patreon page. Do you want to hear your name here at the top of the show? Are you enjoying this podcast and would like to help me make more episodes? Then head over to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash ketowoman or hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. It means a great deal to me and you will get to headline the show just like Dawn did today. This week's extraordinary woman is Louise Reynolds, who has been on the podcast a few times now. Louise is a military wife to Andrew and mum to three adult sons. In her working life, she was the first Australian female paramedic to gain her PhD and then moved into university and college teaching roles. Since late 2015, both Louise and Andrew have addressed a number of health issues, along with maintaining their respective weight loss. For the last 18 months, while living and working in the UK, she has taken the opportunity to travel throughout the UK and Europe. Louise will now be joining Andrew on his next posting in Bangkok, Thailand. Louise and I have become good friends over the last few years, and it has been wonderful having her live in my time zone, as she was previously on the other side of the world. I will really miss her when she switches time zones again soon, but I'm sure she is going to have a fabulous time in Bangkok. So without further ado, let's find out more about Louise's travels. Welcome back, Louise, to the Keto Woman podcast. You've been on a few times now. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you, Daisy. And it's so lovely to see you again, Um, having recently just had the privilege, the honour of um, actually coming to to stay with you (laughs) in your part of, or your literally neck of the woods in the south of France. Yeah, it was just lovely to see you in person. And we meant to record when we were together, but of course... Yeah, we were. We didn't get round to it. (laughs) We were too busy having, you know, enjoying each other's company. We were. 
and it was lovely to catch up with you seeing as I didn't get to Keto Fest this year. So, um, yeah, I certainly made up for my my squishy hugs. <laughs> so where are you right now? Because you're in the midst of traveling all over the place. I'm speaking to you from Geneva in Switzerland. This theme for this little short holiday was mountains and cheese. <laughs> What I like to do with each of my little trips is basically have a theme, the sorts of research that I do. I try and, you know, just find something really unique about the places that I visit. And that's part of the journey for me is obviously doing the research. I have a few travel blog sites that um, I like to to research and to read and, um, yeah, before I, I land here. I'm not one of those intuitive travelers. I am trying to be more intuitive with my traveling. I do have a spreadsheet and I try and map out. <laughs> you and your spreadsheets. <laughs> I'm, I just don't want to miss out on anything. And I just I get anxious. <laughs> I mean, the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out is real because being Australian, coming to the UK and to Europe, it's such a long way to come and I really don't want to miss out and I really want to make the most of it. Yes, I do have a spreadsheet and it is mapped not to the minute, but it is blocked in time. And certainly when I have bookings um, for tours and little walking tours and yeah, just trying to, to make the most of the things that I'm really wanting to, to see. So the theme for this one was was certainly about the great food in Switzerland and certainly making the most of just the location here in Geneva. Well, I thought it would be fun to talk a bit about keto and travelling as you're doing so much of it. So, yes, our theme for this podcast is keto and travelling. And you mentioned just then about some different blogs you read. And I know that you're a member of some different Facebook groups for traveling and in particular women's groups for traveling. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about those because I know you found those really helpful, haven't you? They have been a real godsend. And, you know, being here as I have been for the last 18 months in the UK and really wanting to make the most of, of certainly the opportunities being based here and taking, they call them city breaks. So just having the, the little city breaks that I've been um, been taking on, on weekends. And one in particular is She Spreads Her Wings and it's run by a New Zealand lady and she was based obviously in London. So she's returned back to New Zealand and it's a great community of women travellers, particularly solo women travellers. They do organise tours in the UK as well as in the EU. And it's just like-minded women who love to travel. One of the women there, well, she was quite an inspiration and she sort of, you think my spreadsheets were impressive? You should see her spreadsheet. I did a tour, a weekend city break to Oslo. And it was just absolutely fantastic joining this group of women. Admittedly, they're young enough to be my daughters, but that's okay. And it was just really great to be with like-minded women enjoying Oslo. So it was actually really interesting because they were mainly Aussies and New Zealand um, women. And we have a relationship with the UK where, you know, young people can come and work and live in the UK for up to two years on a visa. So that's how they're under 31. So most of them are up to um, up to 31-year-olds. And I kept up with them. I outwalked them and I outlasted them in terms of just energy levels. So hitting those museums and yeah, doing the free walking tours, seeing the city sites, it was actually, yeah, it was really good. So that was a really interesting weekend because these young people, professional people, are on a very tight budget. So, yeah, shared a dormitory in a hostel on a bunk bed. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, which is, it's okay. Um, thankfully, I paid, I sprung for a, a, a double and I had my own ensuite because being that older lady, I prefer to have, not to share my bathroom with six other people. And I, you know, if I want to go and pee in the middle of the night, then I can go and do that in the privacy of my own um, ensuite um, bunk bed. Um, so that was, that was interesting. So that was, yeah, she spreads her wings. There is another couple of groups that I have joined and that's obviously just finding other Aussies who travel. 
one of the travel blogs that is a a great one it's a little bit like lonely planet but it has different different sites it's called the culture trip and the culture trip is a great website where you type in the city that you want to go to and it has how do you spend three days in geneva or you know the top 10 things that you want to see and it's a quality publication and the links are really good so for example uh last weekend after i saw you i was in athens for four days and the culture trip had, you know, an, a suggested itineraries and it has links to uh, the cooking classes. So the, the cooking classes that I did and the walking tours. And that was really uh, well, well worth it. And of course, I do the fact checks. So you fact check and you go to TripAdvisor. And that's a great aggregator for um, all types of things on the forums. And you can obviously get the, the reviews there to sort of see how, um, you know, what their experiences are. And you just take the, take the top, 10, top 10 reviews to find out where, where you're going to be, um, you know, what are you in for. So you've done a mixture of some of the trips away. You've done the whole thing has sort of been organised, hasn't it? And some of them you've just got flights to yes. and from yep. and then done all the organisation yourself. Yeah, and that was another group that I did do was the solo women's. It was a guided tour. So this was completely different to the self-guided young solo women tour. And that was Girls on Travel. So the Girls on Travel was a, a bespoke, I suppose that's one way of saying it, a bespoke small group guided tour just for women. This was done by Gail, who is a Belgian. She's from Belgian lady and absolutely wonderful. Couldn't highly recommend that. And that was down to Cornwall. So from London to Cornwall is at least a good five or six hours to, um, to the south west of England and I just knew that it was going to be hard to get to and again this was with a group of um, was five of us in total and so Gail absolutely organized the car hire the accommodation where we were going to eat there was some flexibility in the itinerary and we just yeah had an absolutely wonderful time um, just with like-minded more professional women so older but I was still obviously slightly older than everybody else. But um, that was another way of um, my travels. As opposed to this one here in Geneva, this is completely by myself. So I set my itinerary just in blocks blocks of time. Athens was by myself, but I chose to do some, some the walking tours, so guided walking tours, just because, you know, you're here in a strange city and just being able to have a bit of company and makes the experience a little bit more connected and being able to, um, certainly with the free guided walking tours, they're really great to orientate yourself to the city initially to find out some of the culture and the history, the architecture, the politics, and you have a sense of authenticity from a local. And that's usually how I've started. And then if there's anything special for my theme, like the, the guided walking tours or the cooking tours, the food tours, the photography tours. That was really great fun. That was in Athens with, um, with Nicoletta, who um, really showed me a more intimate side of her city. And it's really great to, to do that, to have a local, you know, show you the, the more intimate insights of the cities. Is that when you got to see the local cats and things? The cats of Athens. Oh, <laughs> you know, what a fantastic, um, yeah, they have obviously a policy, the city, Athens City Council. They actually gathered up the dogs. They neutered the dogs, vaccinated, and they also um, microchipped the dogs. They didn't actually have the cat, the cat wranglers. These are stray dogs, presumably you're talking about. These are the stray dogs. Yep. Yeah. yeah, these are the stray dogs. But the cats themselves are so well looked after by the locals. They, you know, have adopted the cats. You do see bowls of food out for them and water and, you know, bickies in alcoves. The interesting thing was that all of the cats were really friendly. You know, they weren't mangy or scabby. They were well looked after and very, very friendly and looking for hugs and pats, which just warmed my heart being a cat person. I love cats. I like dogs. But love cats 
the cats of Athens was a real a real highlight, especially the ones that were hanging around the Acropolis. They made great shots, great Instagram shots, and um, that was a real highlight. So it's a toss up, I guess, when you're traveling on your own. It must be a bit of a toss up. You can see the advantage with going on a group kind of tour because you've got ready made company there as opposed to the self-guided stuff and organizing your own things. Absolutely. Yeah. So I did a three day tour from Dublin up to Belfast. So to Northern Ireland and then back through Galway back to, to, um, to Dublin. So this was another level of guided tour. So this was a, uh, with 15 other people. So it was a bigger tour, a bus tour. And, I didn't like the rush. So you only had two hours at the Titanic Museum. You only had two hours at the Giant's Causeway. You only had two hours here in um, in Galway. Yeah, I can see how when I'm building my itineraries now, like how I really wanted to be able to have the flexibility of, um, you know, being able to do my own thing, which is great. And, you know, if I do want to go off walking and being more intuitive and letting myself go and if it's like okay Louise it's not on the spreadsheet today but you know take take that risk it's okay Um, you might explore an adventure I do have google maps so um, I'm not going to get too lost that was really lovely about wandering the streets around Athens just recently it was just just meandering through through the streets and um, yeah getting lost is part of the journey as they say yeah, I think that's one of the nicest things, especially on city breaks, is just to wander about. Yeah, and we certainly did get lost in Paris, didn't we, last year? Yeah, well, that is a particularly beautiful city to wander around. We had that difference, didn't we? You were you were on your phone looking at the maps, and I had an old-fashioned paper map. And, uh, well, I won't crow too much about which one won out. <laughs> Yeah, but it helps being able to speak the language so when you're asking for directions. So, um, yeah, you had a distinct advantage with your paper map. But I've gotten better. I have gotten better with my <laughs> with my map reading. I can say that. I think the difference is, and I've noticed this with GPS stuff in the car, if you're following a map or if you've, say, looked up your journey to wherever you're going on a map and sort of planned it out a bit in your head – When you're trying to navigate that, you're looking around a lot more to work out where the landmarks are according to the map you've got in front of you. Whereas I think the tendency is when you're looking at a phone, especially if you've put in, you know, how do I get to so and so? So you're following an arrow is that you're looking at the phone rather than looking around you. And I think quite often we found this in London, didn't we? That quite often when there are tall buildings around it just goes completely wrong and you end up following the arrow the wrong way. Whereas if you're using your intuition a bit more and you're looking around and you're thinking, hold on a minute, this doesn't feel right. Right. You use your own sense of direction a bit more, I think, when you're just using a paper map. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm probably a bit of an old-fashioned fogey when it comes to things like that. (laughs) The GPS certainly, the ping on the GPS doesn't register with those very tall buildings and we found that when we were... That was last year when we were at the PHC conference and we're trying to get from our hotel back to the conference centre and we were completely going the wrong way. You're right, so certainly a lot better. And I think that's finding yourself in in those cities and orientating yourself is um, is a really good thing in those landmarks. And certainly being an older lady and and thinking about safety and my whereabouts, I am very conscious of what my whereabouts are and that sort of general travel travel safety and it's really hard for me because I'd look like a tourist and certainly when I was well it's hard red hair freckles and here I am in the dead center of Athens and um yeah I don't look very Greek and um yeah even from the north I tried to say well maybe I'm from the north of northern Greek but um, I think the red hair is a bit of a bit of a giveaway And I try and, you know, walk with purpose and try and not look at my phone too much so you're not looking down, but have a sense of where my next steps are going to go. There are certain cities where you're very conscious of pickpockets. Apparently Athens was notorious for pickpockets. And uh, Prague, Prague was apparently another place for for pickpockets as well. But I didn't have any problems um, in in Prague. So that that was really good. 
So the big initial travel adventure was coming to live and work in the UK, but you've been to all sorts of places in the, how long have you been here now? A year, I say here, but in the UK, a a year and a half, something like that. What was your, what was the length of the stay altogether? Yeah, it's coming up to 18 months now. So I've managed to tick off the big cities. So Amsterdam, Rome, Oslo, France, of course. Um, So we're both in Paris and I've seen you twice. I've been to to Ireland, so both um, the Republic and Northern Ireland. Looking at my list, I've been to Brussels. That was for the Christmas markets. That was particularly particularly nice. Then Barcelona, again, that was that was good fun. Prague, Krakow. I'll focus on then here in Geneva, Athens, and my next trip is back to Norway to see the Northern Lights. I don't think I've missed out anything. I've managed to cover quite a bit of the UK, which was Cardiff. Glasgow, Edinburgh, Belfast, and I flew into Manchester. That was with Heidi. So we went up to the Real Food Rocks, Liverpool, and around Essex where I'm based. So there's lots of little little villages around in, in rural, rural Essex. And, of course, you went down to Cornwall as well. Yeah, Cornwall. I can't forget that one. As well as, obviously, the day trips to, to London. So that was really good. So... Oxford, Cambridge, Gloucester, and I went up to Abbey Road, you know, all those big sites in, in London. Harry Potter World, that was a highlight too. That was good fun, getting my, my Harry Potter on. <laughs> and I saw Pink at Wembley. That was good fun. Dover, Worthing. But you missed out on John. I missed out on Elton John. You had that organised, didn't you? But you missed out on that. That was a shame. Yeah, that was um, unfortunate. My mother and my my auntie had a cruise that was suddenly cancelled, so they ended up having to having to stay with me for that week. That was a nightmare, wasn't it? There was this series of three different cruises that they were. Wasn't it your mum, your aunt and your uncle, was it? And they were all yeah. overlapping on different cruises. And didn't they end up, were they all cancelled in the end? All three cruises. All three cruises cancelled. and they were stranded in the UK. And obviously this is the the nightmare that was being stuck in the UK when their cruise was cancelled and having to rebook flights. And the rebooking of the flights was basically buying a new ticket. So they just had to, to sit out 10 days with me, which was lovely. Mm. Like, you know, that was an unexpected um, bonus of having having my mum and my aunt and then my uncle in the UK. But, yeah, I really felt for them in, in having to, yeah, be stuck somewhere where they were anticipating their beautiful cruise of the islands, the British islands. But anyway. Mm. That was a real shame. And you've been influenced somewhat with things that have come up during your stay like you've formed a friendship with your housemate and I think that influenced some of the traveling you did. Yeah absolutely fantastic this young lady who I've been having my share accommodation experience and this is what I was saying to my family how developmentally delayed I am having my gap year my gap extended gap year abroad is actually having a share accommodation experience so in my early 20s I never shared with non-relatives I was always living with with the boyfriend at the time or I moved back home or and then obviously getting married and moving out so I never actually lived um, in university accommodation that's not how we do things in Australia when we have our university experience we tend to stay home and commute to campus so I never lived in dormitory or residential halls is that true? Do people tend to go to university in their hometown then? They, they don't go to one further away where they have to then find accommodation. It's more normal. I would say it's more normal in the UK to go to one further away. So you end up in accommodation of some kind. That's right. Yeah. And that's typically there are good, good universities in those hometowns unless you want a specialist program 
or unless you're a kid from the country, from the bush, and you have to sort of live live in accommodation. But typically for most of the kids that come to campus, they are local kids that are that are still at home with their parents unless they have moved out of home and they're older. Oh, that's interesting. So it's really kind of just then, it's almost more of a continuation of, of high school, the school education in a way then, yeah? Because it really, the university experience, I always think of it in the UK, and I think it's probably the same in the States and other places uh, in Europe, that part of the university experience is it's that first time when you move away from home. So it's not just a, a change in the level of education, but it's also when you kids tend to have their first living on their own experience. That's absolutely right. And I really admire these young people who have left, obviously, their home and their parents and they're managing their money, they're managing their food. All the time they're having these developmental experiences of this milestone of, you know, moving out of home and the separation from their support networks. And we're expecting them to study and pass. You know, it's really, you know, there's some big life events for these young people, which I really admire, let alone, you know, my experience, which is very much a a migratory experience. You know, I was separated from my family not that it's dissimilar in terms of my life skills. I mean, I'm quite resourceful as a, as a highly functioning adult, but certainly the separation from, from my support networks as well. So I really resonated with these young people um, in terms of their university experience, which really um, my housemate, so this young lady in her late 30s, I was sharing, sharing the house with not only her, with a young man as well who runs a small business in, in the village and this young lady works in retail, 10 hours a day. This poor woman, you know, working for, um, you know, a pittance of a pay. So we formed quite a, quite a good friendship. You know, she really helped me through this experience of being away from my family. We travelled together to Prague and we also just recently went to Krakow in Poland. So she's, she is from Poland. So that also helped travelling with, with a native speaker. We did little day trips to London, so she enjoys photography, travel photography as well. Yeah, it's been really formed a really fast, fast friendship. So more than happy to to be there when she came home at the end of the day, someone to to offload to, obviously people who know working in retail with their customer service experiences. It's really quite a, a hard emotional job and physical as well. So physical standing on her feet for 10 hours a day. She's really going to miss you when you go. I know, I do feel for that and the landlord now is asking me to interview prospective tenants so I am having the privilege of, you know, trying to select someone who can replace me Um, (laughs) and and one of the questions is, will you make tea for Eva when she comes home from work? (laughs) So um, you have to make it, it's a peppermint tea, it's a special peppermint tea with two sugars, she's not keto so that's for sure. But I'm just really trying to find someone that can be a little bit of a social a social outlet for her as well. Talking about keto, how do you find that when you're traveling? You've obviously been to a lot of different places. I should imagine some are more keto than others. But how do you find it traveling in general and then going somewhere new where obviously you don't know exactly what the food landscape is going to be? I guess you found out a bit of that with your research so you'll know what to expect to a certain extent but but how have you found that how have you found managing to stay keto have you managed to stay keto in your travels it has certainly been a challenge and you're right you know some countries were were exceptionally better in terms of accessibility i think the country that i probably struggled the most might have been ireland and um, certainly going around in terms of, yeah, very dense potatoes, but obviously the meat options are, were fine there, so with, with lamb. The key thing that I have found is travelling is stressful at the start. So right from the start, I'm already in a stress state because I'm just anxious about getting to the airport. I am, you know, don't want to miss my plane or my train or actually getting, you know, on the trains to the airport. So I'm going to be hyper stressed anyway, which already puts me in a, not an agitated, but I feel hungry already. 
So I think I've mentioned once or twice before on these podcasts that I love pork scratchings. So I take at least, you know, four or five, six pork scratching packets with me. So I do actually come prepared with some travel snacks. The other snacks that I have is Marks and Spencer's has a three for seven pound um, sort of option. So I pre-pack that with bacon. There's some chicken strips and there was mozzarella balls as well. So I pop them in my backpack. The thing then I try and do is where I am situated. So part of the planning, and this goes on the spreadsheet, is to sort of find out where the local supermarkets are. That's obviously hard when, say, in Athens. Athens doesn't necessarily do supermarkets, but they do do little local regional neighbourhood farmers markets Mm -hmm. and being able to to get where can I get my fresh um, food and some of the accommodation that I do stay in has is apartments or um, they sort of have have kitchen facilities and I can then cook for cook with local ingredients as well so being able to access fresh ingredients that makes it a little bit different say for instance if I was in a cheaper accommodation as I am here in Geneva there's no fridge it really upsets me when with the tea and coffee facilities there's no spoon it's like Geez, I'm in cheap accommodation. There's no spoon, even for to mix, you know, mix my cream and my coffee. How can they have no spoon? What do they expect you to mix your coffee up with? They have a wooden, you know, like a stick, a wooden stick. Oh, a little stir, I think. Yeah. It's just like, okay, this is very three star, three star information. <laughs> but anyway, but I do bring my whizzer, my little, my froffer, my froffer whizzer. So being able to find a little mini mart, a 7-Eleven, um, and to be able to do that within, you know, a reasonable walking distance. And I tend to buy then sliced cheese, sliced meats, lots of yogurts, cottage cheese. I am loving Switzerland for the cheese, the range of cheeses here, and being able to, to have that. So then it's really about um, making the best choices. That's not to say that I don't necessarily give myself a free pass because I am an abstainer and just being aware that should there be off-plan meals or choices, then obviously that's I've done the best I could at the time in terms of researching. For example, um, I was traveling with uh, my partner, Andrew. We were in Belgium. So Andrew loves, uh, he wanted to try this particular beer. Mm. It's only produced by these special monks at this abbey in west west of Belgium. Pretty unique. Yeah, it's a unique experience, you know. And I think when we were listening to other podcast guests, which were talking about only sugar on Sundays, um, so, you know, if you're only going to have a croissant, then you can have a croissant in France. If you're only going to have Belgian beer, then, you know, have the beer. You know, it's not like it's every day. So that's the same for the chocolate in Switzerland. But it may only be four pieces because it's good artisanal artisanal chocolate. It's the big thing that comes up, I think, with travelling and the dilemma that people have. If you're going somewhere I guess if you're not a foodie it doesn't really matter if the food of a particular culture doesn't interest you that much but I think most people who travel food is a part of it and there will be things wherever you're going that there's something that is particularly unique to that country to that region and it's that dilemma do I have it when it's not keto because it's my, this is going to be the only chance I ever get to try it. Do I have it or do I stay keto? And it's, it is a difficult dilemma, I think. And I think the only way to figure out whether that's something that you can do or not is knowing yourself, is knowing whether you can, like you say, is keep it in that box, keep it in that, I only have a croissant when I'm in France or if you can manage it that way I don't know what do you think about that because you've been doing a lot of traveling and that must that dilemma must come up a lot the thing that resonated for me was certainly that trip trip with Andrew in in Belgium so it was a combination of the Belgian beer and the Belgian chocolate and that really 
um, the effects. So what I really noticed was the next day was the fact that I felt miserable. I was, you know, I had tears running down my face. You know, I was, my mood just dropped. So what that sort of sort of resonated with me was I reached obviously my carbohydrate sort of my threshold and it impacted um, on my pain my skin was itchy but the thing that was the critical threshold was my mood we're driving back to the um, the rental car back to the airport um, to fly to fly back and I'm going Andrew I don't know what's wrong (laughs) with me I'm just you know (laughs) and I'm going this is like this out of body experience. It was just watching this train wreck. And I'm going, is it, you know, had I reached obviously this particular sort of, you know, threshold of, you know, too many, you know, too many carbohydrates. And since I've been in the UK, I've been quite lazy carnivore. And I started tracking again. And most days I was perhaps well and truly below 20 and some days I was below 10, 10 grams of carbohydrate. I was going to say be pretty low I should think. Yeah. If you're pretty well carnivore you're going to be really low. So with the beer tasting platter that we had the previous evening and obviously we you know when you're in Belgium trying Belgian chocolates but it was only like four chocolates it wasn't excessive but the impact that I know now and it's a great feedback loop so when you're sort of suggesting well you know how do you manage this I think I have this most recent experience of be prepared for the outcome so that's fine and you know I don't tend to do rules because I'm such a hard abstainer I can't do this I can't manage But if I do make that choice, and I think the choices are very powerful because I do want to get a sense of, you know, this experience of the city, you know, I'm walking the city and part of that is being a foodie. I love, you know, to connect with the the place and the culture through food and just having that opportunity of when will I be back in France to have one croissant? And certainly if I'm still keeping it below 100, then I'm doing okay. I also write that off as I know calories in, calories out, but I tend to do at least 20,000 steps a day. So I'm doing over 15, you know, kilometers. So that's, you know, I'm traveling a lot by foot on the walking that I do do. And have you found actually that that makes an impact in balancing it out? I mean, you said before about this, the Belgian beer and the chocolate, and you really felt the effects afterwards and presumably that's that's going to be something that plays into that initial decision about whether you do it or not because there's all there's that the argument for exploring the local food culture but if it's going to make you feel really crappy and perhaps right off the next day then perhaps it's not really worth it but have you found maybe when you are away somewhere like that like you say you tend to do more walking than you would normally do have you actually found that that's a counter to having maybe slightly high carb food that actually because you're you're using it because you're walking so far have you found that maybe the impact is slightly different than it would be say if you did it at home in your usual environment I think you, you've hit the, hit the nail on the head because leading up to a certainly these re- most recent trips and um, my training, so I've been weightlifting and um, certainly a lot of hard hard weightlifting in the regime that I have been doing. So this month is um, the gym that I've been going to is doing Squattober. So you can follow that on Instagram, um, Squattober. So part of that is before I go, I do actually do some active training, not with the intent that it's a free pass. It's just obviously um, certainly the the physical stuff that I know that I need to be able to be fit enough to to walk the miles that I do. Certainly the miles that I, I do cover while I'm here is something that I can, I don't want to use as a free pass and, and trade off. But I certainly think the bouncing back the next day is is something that I can do, and it is a bit of it is a bit of a trade off in in that that if I am having a off plan meal, then I'm certainly fasting to get myself back into my normal sort of feeling better um, state as well. 
and certainly in a very expensive country like Oslo was expensive to travel and certainly here in Geneva it's it certainly is expensive for regular meals then I am you know on a budget and trying to make the most of the meals that I do prepare or you know not eating out just having some yogurts and some sliced cheese and meats. And obviously eating out is part of the experience, so you want to do that to a certain extent. But how have you found navigating the menus in countries where you don't necessarily understand what it is you're looking at? So a little bit of research beforehand. Um, so TripAdvisor is really good and the websites, so I can actually uh, have a look at that. The Google Translate is a really great app to be able to do that. So it actually has a camera function. So you just hover over. And I do that in the supermarkets with the nutrition labels. Oh, great. Okay. So you can like sort of scan it yeah. and it will read it and give you the translation. Oh, that's fantastic. Yep. So Google Translate is really good for that. And knowing what carbohydrates, fats and protein is in many different languages now. So I can generally work out the nutrition labels um, for that as well. And especially when you're actually looking at some of the processed meats and just making sure that the mystery sausages that I'm picking up aren't sort of, you know, not too many fillers and fillings in, in that sort of thing. Oh, that's a good tip, actually. So where you're going to a new country, part of your research is just to find out what carbohydrate protein and fat is in whichever language you're going so i know we were speaking about this before yep. when you go away to a new place you have some basic phrases that you find out what they are in the local language yeah un grand cafe s'il vous plaît <laughs> Allonge, allonge, allonge. That was what I used today. Allonge, un allonge, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> so, yeah, that's um, actually that that's a me. good tip for a, a cheap black coffee. That's basically an Americano. It's an espresso with water added to it. Rather than if you were to ask for a Grand Cafe, then you get two shots. So you get double the price for a coffee. Whereas an allonge, you get the same amount of liquid, but it's more watered down. So it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> that was only 150 euro so that was quite a cheap there you go you see because you're just paying for one shot of coffee if you'd have one had shot. the yeah. Grand Cafe that would have cost you uh, yeah three euros it's actually five francs it was five Swiss francs in the cafe yesterday but I actually got an extra shot so trois so I asked for trois shots <laughs> yeah oh wow <laughs> I was buzzing I was buzzing it was an early flight yesterday so I had to yeah be at the airport at 6 a.m so I needed trois shots my high school French what have been your favorites from the different countries you've been to you've obviously you've been to quite a few what have been your highlights I think if we're looking at keto and travel, then of all places, I'm, I mean, it might be a bit a bit of a challenge, but Rome was fantastic. So aside from the pizza and the pasta, but Rome has the most magnificent delicatessen. I found on a, on a travel blog, it was actually over on the other side, not for, in central Rome. You had to walk walk over on the other side. This most fantastic family-run delicatessen. And I just said, look, here's 10 euro. And I just want a selection of meats and cheeses. That looked too good. That looked good. So they gave me a couple of slices and they made up this most magnificent takeaway pack of food. That's got to be, a, that was a real highlight that I really enjoyed. Even, you know, Amsterdam. So Amsterdam for a budget traveler, if you go to the Hamer in the center of the city and for 150, you can just have a sausage. So the smoked sausage with mustard. That was really good too. So if you're looking for a cheap, a cheap meal, I think I probably ate there every day. <laughs> Barcelona was a challenge because of the tapas, the little bites that they had. That was hard because each of the little tapas aren't came. a lot of those quite good though. Tapas, when I think of tapas, quite a few of them should be good. No. But they were on bread. Oh, that was the no. only thing. They came on bread. Oh really? I thought the whole point was a lot of them. They come in their little tapas dishes. I did a, the walking tour to, it was about four different four different tapas bars. And I ended up just scraping the tops off of them. I looked a bit weird, <laughs> you know, scraping the, the tops off of them. They didn't actually have the bites that came in those little dishes. It might have been different, but even in the selection behind in the bars, they were certainly all breaded. Really? Breaded or on bread. Mm. So that was, that was interesting. Now, Prague... I mean, I loved Prague because it actually had the most massive, like, 
uh, it was about two pounds, um, so it was about 900 grams of a pork knuckle. That was the best value for money. That was the meal. It was so big I couldn't eat it. I had to get it taken away, and, um, yeah, that was really great value for money and um, deliciously keto, and it had the skin and the crackle, and, um, yeah, the pork knuckle was absolutely fantastic. On one of the menus was a, a steak place that had the capriccio, so that was absolutely delicious as well. Carpaccio. Carpaccio, yeah. Athens was really good too, and it was really interesting to see the Mediterranean. So the sun, the food, it was fresh, it was seasonal, it was local. The people going to the farmer's markets every day, the fish market as well as the meat um, in the central markets was amazing. Just And that was completely nose to tail. The food there, um, or certainly the meat preparation, nose to tap literally there was big livers kidneys hocks tripe everything and everything you know that was the range of seafood from the small sort of white bait fishes to um the sardines and octopus calamari yeah i have to say it's something i noticed more in france actually if you're in the uk all that offerly type stuff tends to be very cheap because people don't really eat it that much in france a lot of it's actually not necessarily hugely expensive, I suppose, but a lot more money than you'd expect it to be because people do eat it all. So, you you know, you see all of that stuff in the supermarkets, gizzards and mm. different kinds of offal. Yeah, everything. And the fact that they, it was nose to tail and the liver, there was like so much liver there. It looked really, obviously really nutrient dense, as they say. Mm. Poland, so Krakow, and that was – I'm just trying to think where we where we ate out. Uh, we had an apartment, and that was obviously – I was going to say, you know, the range. So we found a found a, a supermarket, and we ate – I ate so much kielbasa. Oh, my gosh, and the cheese. It was delicious. The kielbasa was just – I just chose a selection of um, different, different sausages there. There aren't many places, really, that you – go to that you can't get a selection of cooked cold meats and cheeses so you've always kind of got that as an option haven't you yeah again we did eat out one night and that was sauerkraut so there was the fermented foods and it was a pork so that was a pork belly i think i had pork belly so that was that was easy but traveling in the UK around and that's just basically that was easy enough to do when I was staying staying out for my little short trips around. So that was easy, obviously, trying to do that. But mainly the roasts. So when, when I had my mother and my aunt there, so we I just took them out to, to places where we could actually get some, some roast dinners and just avoided the, the Yorkshire pudding and the potatoes. That was easy enough to do. And so your next big adventure is Thailand. Yes, we'll be spending Christmas in the tropics. Be landing mid-December. Andrew has a promotion, which has meant me leaving the um, the UK and joining him in Thailand, in Bangkok, for uh, three years. And that will be the next interesting chapter and in how um, Louise does keto in Bangkok. That's going to be going to be a challenge. I'm looking forward to, I think, pork and seafood and chicken, not the noodles, not the rice. I think really the challenge I would say in Thailand is eating out. I don't think just like anywhere else when you're cooking for yourself, you know, the selection you've got in the supermarkets there is absolutely fantastic. The fresh food that's on offer, the vegetables, a lot of the vegetables and herbs, you know, it's above ground, green, leafy stuff. So if you're cooking at home and, you know, exploring the new and different flavors of the country that way, it's going to be really super easy it's the eating out, I think, that's a lot more complicated. They have all this balancing of the flavors and some of those are okay, but there's always going to be some kind of sweet in there because they have this whole sweet, sour, salty, spicy, you know, and some of those things are fine, but it's, it's the sweet that I think that is really difficult to avoid. So I think you have to make that decision 
if you're going to eat out in the main to accept that there's probably going to be a little bit of something in some of it. But still, as you said before, is to make the best choice you can, given the options you have. Absolutely. I think you're right. And that'll be the expat. So the expat life will be obviously eating out and socialising with um, with Andrew and his work. So that will be yeah, some of that trade-off. Andrew already has, um, he's started to start cooking already. He's done some recipes and one of them is num prick on, which is a minced, a spicy mince. So, and that comes with the paste. And I think you're right. It would be like looking at the labels and just, you know, just making your best guess as to what are the hidden sugars in in those sorts of preparations. Mm. And they use a lot of that sort of palm sugar, you're right, in terms of the sour and the spice to, to dampen the sour and the spice. I think the cleaner the food will be those street foods that you can sort of see them making um, in the streets. But certainly expat life hopefully there might be some steak places there that you don't have to have local foods if if you miss miss having regular regular western palate foods not spicy i'm a wimp <laughs> i'm I, I don't know about chili i don't know how much chili what my chili tolerance will be but i'm an absolute wimp when it comes to chili so i think i'm gonna have to harden up and just go with the flow and just embrace it and do the best i can didn't you say you'd found some keto groups already over that way? Not the keto groups. I found an expat women's group. Right. And thank goodness for the internet, I can tell you, because... It makes a, such a difference. Such a difference. So expat women living in Bangkok, and I found this particular group, and it was really wonderful just to be able to search and scroll back through. They have a book club already. Um, so the next, you know, the next, you know, they're reading the next book for the next month, but I won't be able to make November uh, or October, November, but I'll be there in December. But things like finding a hairdresser for wavy and curly hair. I am f so grateful. And, um, yeah, so just being able to find those things that we take for granted on a daily level, you know, about our ordinary life and finding, say, bigger sizes for, for women. So there was obviously big shoes. So um, that's going to be an issue. But what they also had sort of put on there also is the online shopping, those supermarkets that do online deliveries. I was so relieved to find that um, they have a Tesco's there. So that's a UK supermarket brand. Um, so they have a one based in, in Bangkok. So, you know, that's just, it's made my um, anxiety about how I'm going to cope on a daily level and really supporting Andrew in this promotion. But you'll find the, the supermarkets there. I think that's the beauty, actually, when you're eating keto because you're used to buying the stuff that isn't in a package. And that's going to be the same in those supermarkets. Okay, so there are going to be some things that you aren't familiar with, some of the vegetables that will be a bit different, but you're going to be in those sections. You're going to be in the fresh food sections. And they're fantastic. You know, I'm imagining in my head now the, the supermarket that my father tends to go to. And there's, you know, there's just all sorts of lovely stuff. And you'll just be able to try it, you know, or oh, I'm not familiar with this green leafy vegetable, I'll take it home and I'll try it. And knowing you, you'll make friends and and find out what they do, you know, what they taste like, what you can do with them. I mean, you know, I've already given you my father and stepmother's contact number. So you can you can speak to my stepmom and send her pictures of things. And what do I do with this? <laughs> she can go because she loves she loves to cook. And so I'm sure she'll she'll enjoy <laughs> telling you what to do with various vegetables and and all sorts of things. So it'll be good fun. I think I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, and just as this this time has been learning and, you know, the resilience and the adaptability and that's right, and immersing myself in, in UK and European cultures, I'm not, not unfamiliar with, with the Asian, obviously being based in Australia and having travelled extensively through Asia. So, But I think it's different when you're there every day. Mm. Oh, so very, this is yeah. the immersive experience yeah. of daily life i mean it's different when you sort of come in and fly into a full board type accommodation holiday the romanticism of oh geez i could live here but the daily grind of you know navigating a country where i don't speak the language 
thankfully Andrew does, so he's learning, doing his language course now. At least I'll have someone that can speak the language. But everything that I've learned from my, from my, certainly from my travels and um, just the adaptability of using Google Translate or just going, you know, my best communication skills of, you know, sign language and, and fluffing my way through. I haven't caused any diplomatic or, you know, any international incidents so far, but, um, you know, it's not past me to make a wrong turn or, you know. But anyway, that's 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 to be like seen. Like you say, though, it's amazing, isn't it? Now, what we have in the capabilities just in a phone now, technology really has made travelling a whole lot easier. But I think that's the other thing is not being too focused on on that journey, you know, or or that metaphor of, you know, it's about, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Mm. And sometimes when we do just even just using our mobile device, like you said, the old school, getting lost and meandering through the streets and taking it in and just being mindful of the moment of, wow, the heritage, the, you know, that building was built in 1638 or taking time to do a little bit of research before I go to sort of know about the history like the Greek mythology on those walking tools was just amazing. And just, you know, that enrichment. So being there for the enrichment of the experience and taking it all in. Mm. Well, I wish you luck in the, the next stage of your travels. You've shared a few of the different tips and the things that you found useful. But what would be your top tip to leave us with today? Well, maybe it is about the journey. You know, just embrace the journey, be mindful of the journey. It's not necessarily about, well, you know, the destination. Mm, enjoying the journey along the way. And what happens? Just being, I suppose, like you say, that being mindful and being open to enjoying experiences that crop up that aren't part of your plans. Because that's where you can have some of the most fun in just spontaneous things that show up. And if you're too focused on the schedule of what you had planned, you might turn away from those opportunities. Yeah, and I think that's where I've tried to be more intuitive with that and you know, the things that haven't appeared on the on the spreadsheet um, and some of those off the beaten track experiences have just been, as you said, some of the most enriching and finding that little cafe or finding that little street or finding that little street cat to pat. Um, yeah, that's been been really wonderful. And the guides, you know, the people that are there to to guide you through their city and having a local to to do that, to show me their most intimate parts of, of their city. You know, it's a real privilege. And I have been privileged to meet some wonderful people through both my work um, and through my travels, yeah, it's it certainly is about the journey of those people that I've that I've met, and that's been the most, I suppose, the most evocative is the the privilege of of that insight about myself over this last eighteen months is just I can do stuff like how amazing is that? Like I can turn up to a city and I can get from A to B, and I can still obviously eat or choose not to eat. You know, I can certainly travelled. I calculated how many flight miles I've done over the last 18 months. So I've travelled at least 90,000 miles wow. or 110,000 kilometres. And I put that into perspective as three times around the globe. Wow. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, I've done some flight miles certainly in this last 18 months. So for those of you that are thinking about my carbon footprint, I don't have a car. Um, I do recycle. So I think my carbon offset um, credits are, are there. Certainly the last 18 months I've not had a car, which has been, again, that's been interesting as well. So navigating public transport. So my journeys have certainly taken me far and wide, which has been an absolute privilege for my family who have supported me in taking this opportunity to really it's the journey of self-discovery has been really really fantastic you know, feel then i should have done this years ago but you know my life stages didn't lend itself to being able to take the time out of my career at the time and in the relationships that i was in but you know it's been absolutely grateful to my family for letting me have this opportunity and i'm looking forward to reconnecting 
maybe you've enjoyed it more doing it at this stage anyway. It's a bit like a lot of people say when they go back into education a lot later in life, they actually get a lot more out of it because they're choosing to do it and they're just embracing that experience in a different way rather than it just being that part of the standard sort of progression that you do at a certain age, a certain time in your life to actually do it at a different time. I think you come at it from a different perspective and maybe get more out of it because of that. Absolutely. And being an older adult, the more mature, more mature lady, it certainly makes a lot more sense. If I was in my up to the Australian visa, let's these young people up to their 31. So, you know, you can imagine the early 20s or mid 20s, you know, person who, who, you know, young and single and making the most of that time abroad. And you know, the fact that that might have been a lot of, you know, drinking and social stuff, and that's fine. That's where they're at developmentally. But career-wise, this was a great opportunity career-wise internationally. And financially, I could afford to do the types of travel that I did do a lot more than if I was in my early 20s on a lower wage. But certainly, I'm immensely grateful for the opportunity for my um, my family for, for letting me have this opportunity. Yeah. And supporting me in this opportunity, I should say. Mm. They're not letting me. I'm doing it. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> See you later. Bye. <laughs> well, enjoy the next stage in your travels. And I hope to meet up with you in Thailand over sometime over the next three years when you're there. I'm planning a trip at some point. I'm not sure when it will be, but I will be over there at some point. So we will meet up in Bangkok. (laughs) I will look forward to that. And um, yeah, I'll be definitely picking up the phone and speaking to your stepmom and and your dad um, very soon when I arrive in, I think it's only 60 days. We'll be there in less than 60 days. So it's fast. Uh, my my UK and European sort of chapters finishing, and then obviously my my Southeast Asia chapter will be starting very shortly. So I'll be looking forward to um, reconnecting with you. Definitely, time has flown. Well, best of luck, and thank you for joining me again today. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you, Daisy. To get the resources and links from this show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash episodes. Please share this podcast with as many people as possible by sharing one of my links or just taking a screenshot of an episode that you enjoyed. Reviews really help raise the profile of the podcast, which gets it in front of more people, but also helps me attract a wide variety of guests. So please take a minute to leave a review on whichever podcast app or platform you like to listen on. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast? Help me make more episodes and videos by making a pledge at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash keto woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. Don't forget to join in the fun on the Keto Woman Podcast Instagram and Facebook pages and Daisy underscore Keto Woman on Twitter. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you would like to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. This week's end quote is from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I think you travel to search and come back home to find yourself there. Bye bye, Keto lovelies. <laughs>